Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Alex. I am your area conference minister. And that means a lot of things. But what that means, most importantly, and I use a lot of sports metaphors, so you'll have to forgive me. I am on your team. It is my hope and prayer that whether it's the joys and celebrations of ministry, the hard times, the difficulties, or the things that are a little bit of each, that I might be one of the first people you think to call to invite me to sit with you, invite me to celebrate with you, to listen to you, to do ministry with you. I long to be that partner for you. And I pledge in this season of transition, my full support and accompaniment to you as you embark on this pastoral transition you are in the midst of. I know you know better than I that you are in incredibly capable hands in your ministerial staff and the lay leaders who are working with me in the search. So trust in them as I trust in you, and together we will see what God has in store for all of us. And of course, I bring you greetings from the entire Southern New England Conference, all of our staff, our executive conference minister, and the 600 plus sibling congregations. You may not see every day, but labor in the vineyard with you and are in prayer with you for your work of ministry here in Boston in every community where God takes you. Friends, there's so much I could say. And I will add, too, you'll see in a moment, I am actually joining today as a member. Uh, <laughs> so if you don't believe me how excited I am of your ministry, I chose to join your church. So that should be a testament to something, right? I could say a lot, but I did prepare a sermon. So let us turn our hearts over to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of each of our hearts be a blessing unto you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, the editor of Luke's Gospel does something somewhat uncommon to open our scripture reading we heard before that beautiful hymn. In verse 1, the editor writes, Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray and not to lose heart. Their need to pray and not to lose heart. So I think that's it. I can go sit down now. That's the lesson. You've got it, right? <laughs> In truth, that is the takeaway. I'm not building to some twist and turn at the end. That is the takeaway. That is what I want you to leave with today. Pray always, or as I might turn that a bit, develop a rich spiritual life and do not lose heart. You see, I'm drawn to this verse not only because it is so clearly set up as the moral of this parable, but also because it speaks so deeply to my own faith, and maybe yours, a reminder that I need daily, and maybe you do too. And it's a message, a reminder, I believe, that many of the congregations I serve throughout the greater Boston region needs to hear. You'll remember the parable centers around a widow and what the scripture calls an unjust judge. The widow, of course, if you don't know, is the biblical stand-in for all those frequently exploited in the ancient world and whose cause was unquestionably just. And as for the judge, the gospel goes out of its way to let you know that this is not the judge compared to God. This is a very different judge who is neither a role model nor a hero. The widow repeatedly implores the judge for justice over and over until eventually she wears him down and he grants her request. 
We're not given many details of the nature of everything, but we can easily imagine and visualize the persistence and maybe even desperation of the widow physically bringing herself before this uncaring judge day after day, week after week, pleading her case likely in public for all to hear. It's a powerful visual for us as a Christian people. Because in every age in living memory, Christian people like us have been required to act with zeal and persistence and even desperation, just like the widow in our parable. Every age has faced challenges, local and global, that have called on people like you and I to be persistent in the face of apathy and disinterest. And if we cannot change the hearts of the metaphorical unjust judges in our world, then maybe through persistent annoyance we can move them out of apathy. Indeed, it was the faithful persistence of black Americans, many mothers, wives, daughters and sisters. It was their persistence in lament and outrage that turned the hearts of many in a nation that had grown apathetic to the sins of racism and white supremacy. And thanks be to God for their persistence. And thanks be to God for the spirit of persistence in so many ways that is a part of Old South Church it will be the persistence of congregations like ours that will be necessary for us to face the challenges of white supremacy, climate change, gun violence, poverty, the list goes on and on, so much more. Yet, while that is true and good and faith, remember where we started, and I promised you the takeaway from our sermon was. Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. The lesson of the need for persistence in the face of our challenges is good and true and real. Let us never waver in our commitments to advocating for justice, especially for those without a voice. But the writer of Luke's gospel went out of their way to remind us that this is first about the persistence of prayer before action. So that we may be the squeaky wheel for justice. And not only for a moment, but through our whole lives long. Now in fairness, after you read the first verse and you get into the actual story, we're easily drawn towards seeing the parable being about action primarily. We can visualize the physical embodied nature of the persistence of the widow. We can see the fruits of her labor. Even the judge is a seeming political figure in that time. And oh, how many of us in the United Church of Christ, and I would bet even here at Old South Church, feel much more at home in that world, in the world of the second chapter of James, you might say, in which our faith is dead without works. Look at the widow putting her faith into action and look at the results, let's do the same. Yes, our persistence in doing good is paramount and even life-changing and saving, but what happens when we grow weary in our persistence? What happens when the moral arc of the universe takes so long to bend towards justice it looks like a line from our perspective? And as we know this world, when we choose to be fully ourselves and present in it, can wear us down. It can wear us down through a lack of progress, yes, but all through, through disconnecting ourselves from whom God has claimed us to be beloved, worthy, beautiful. 
And author Brene Brown reminds us that the truth about who we are lives in our hearts. So when the coming of God's peaceable realm seems too slow, and the world tries to strip us of our God-kissed selves, how will we find the widow's perceived endurance if we've lost our hearts? And so, the author implores us to pray so that we do not lose heart, so that we do not lose our center in our work for justice. Luke's call in our lives is not about forced or contrived piety. It's a call to remember the heart of our faith, to remember the foundation on which we stand that empowers our work for justice in the world, and ultimately to ensure that we have the endurance necessary to run the race, to work for justice in our world, not for a moment, but for our whole lives and for this church for centuries to come. What happens to the athlete who doesn't stretch or warm up before playing, or who doesn't practice? The same is true for us in the work for justice. Who we are and who are we and what can happen to us when we persist only in our work, but not in our spiritual nourishment? And that doesn't necessarily mean kneeling next to our beds, folding our hands, closing our eyes, although it may, if that nourishes you. It's all the ways in which we take the time to attend to our relationship with God through a spiritual practice that nourishes us, worshiping here with our church, maybe attending a small group, or it could be walking through the city or out in the woods. It could be listening to music that touches us deeply in our soul, volunteering, reading a devotional. Do you know the answer for your heart? Whatever it is that we undertake with intentionality, not to accomplish some goal, but rather to fall into God's embrace, and remember whom God has claimed us to be. Beloved, worthy, beautiful. And as your area conference minister, I have a perspective on the work before us as a denomination. I see what we all see in some ways, the need for Christians of love and justice to be present and active in our world. I see, too, what you may not all see, the common challenges of our congregations and what they're facing in this particular moment, questions about what our future looks like, who our members will be, when we'll see them and how we'll see them and how we'll be together, questions about what ministry will look like and how we'll be doing. These questions are universal. The work of justice will persist. And there will be no easy found answers. And they will not come quickly. You may become, you will likely become, you may already be feeling weary as you face them. You may even feel a bit detached from those words I used, worthy, beautiful, and beloved. And so we pause then. For today, to remind ourselves to rest from our persistent doing and attend to our hearts. We pause to take seriously the gospel writer's call to not lose our hearts. And by doing so, we find rest in the midst of a wearying and disorienting world and ensure that when we are inevitably called to find the widow's persistence, to be that squeaky wheel, we find our endurance to do so in our relationship with God and God's unfailing love. Won't the church say amen? Amen. Amen. amen.